You're good. Good afternoon. I'm Larry Moore, publisher of Broadstone Books. And before we begin today's program, I have a statement in response to yesterday's events. In keeping with our statement of values here at Broadstone, we are appalled by the actions of the US Supreme Court in overturning abortion rights. We support without reservation every person's rights to bodily autonomy and identity and unrestricted access to reproductive health care of all kinds, specifically including abortion. We believe that these are natural rights and neither derive from nor may they be abrogated by any law, court, or government. Accordingly, we reject as utterly illegitimate this action by the Supreme Court, along with all laws enacted by Congress or state legislatures to restrict these rights and support resistance in all forms to their effect. We pledge to assist members of our Broadstone community in pursuit of their rights and in gaining access to whatever reproductive health care they require. We also believe that cultural institutions have a vital role to play in sustaining the human spirit through catastrophic times, and that poetry is uniquely suited to express and address this need. As such, we at Broadstone Books are proud to support the work of poets in the world. Today, we continue this work as we welcome you to the June 2022 edition of the Broadstone Reading Stage, featuring readings from new poetry collections by Babo Kamel and Richard St. John. The connection of poetry and myth is an ancient one. Indeed, going back to the origins of language itself and the first stories we told ourselves in order to make sense of our world. Both of our poets today continue in this tradition, though they approach it in distinctly different manners. And Babo Kamel's What the Days Wanted, the connection is overt. Her poems are springing from myth, fairy tales, and art, and most of all from loss and longing. She opens in a mythic world, deriving new lessons from ancient stories as when Icarus advises his daughter to cast off the fixed ideas of who you should be. This leads to a fairy tale of her own devising and in the other version, which introduces us to the ghost mother who haunts this collection, trespassing in someone else's life. Her third section consists of ekphrastic poems riffing on Chagall, Picasso, and Wyeth, both N.C. and Andrew, among others, but especially the emotionally stark canvases of Edward Hopper, which leaves us wanting more of anything. The concluding section is a chronicle of rupture of what has been lost. This was our village. We knew our names and the smell of earth where we planted our dead. We made sure that even the young knew what the days wanted. Instead, we find ourselves in a place where there is no map for this. The geography is too cruel. If some of these poems are painful to read, Kamel does not leave us without hope instructing us to return to childhood, to your mother's house long gone in order to recover our voice, to begin with whispers. She ends with bedtime stories where words begin to bloom in gardens and towns, crawl out from under rocks, ride the subways. Children find them in lunch boxes, devour them with an appetite they didn't know they had. Kamel conducts us through many lives here along a journey where it doesn't matter how we got here through a process by which she unlearned my future in order to say what the days wanted, to come home. 
the cover of Richard St. John's new collection, Book of Entangled Souls, which I should have to hold up for you, but take my word for it. It, it transports us to ancient Greece. Thank you. There's Richard holding his book up. It transports us to ancient Greece, the birthplace of so much of our cultural mythic heritage. But as his title suggests, here he is inspired by the new mythology of our scientific age, employing the otherworldly concepts of entanglement and quantum physics to serve as suggestive metaphors for the complexities and interconnections of human and ecological relationships. But he also looks back to John Donne, who long before the physicists knew that no man is an island. In his poem, Souls, he specifically references Donne's Holy Sonnet 7, transforming Donne's numberless infinities of souls into tourists like me, visiting the poet's tomb in St. Paul's Cathedral. That's a deft trick in using souls in both the corporeal and spiritual sense. And it's a striking image that we are all souls who are tourists in life, all of which demonstrates St. John's poetic mastery running through this volume. In his wide ranging empathetic poems, we encounter the quiet, less heard presences in our world as they worry, warn, suffer, and hope illuminating our shared connections and complicities, private entanglements, and the difficult boundaries we're called upon to cross. These gathered souls watch the glow as the city burns, yet like charged particles in a quantum field, they and all of us emerge shimmering and radiant, perishing and irreducible. Now, more than ever, we need the sustaining power of myth and mystery. We need to recognize how we are all entangled souls, all struggling to come home. We need to hear these poems. And we'll begin this afternoon with Babo Kamel. So welcome, Babo. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that opening statement, Larry. Uh, it just, what, no words uh, after what happened. I wanna thank you, Larry, Sheila, Stephanie for making this possible. And I look forward to reading, to hearing you, Richard, after I finish. And thank you for those wonderful faces I'm looking at. Uh, it's wonderful to see you and uh, very warming. Um, the book I'm gonna be reading from is my new book called what the Days Wanted, and it's a book in four sections. I'll be reading a couple of poems from each section. And as Larry said, the first section uh, begins with myth. Icarus advises his daughter, celebrate yourself, rise above the chorus of gray that keeps you cave hidden and small. Do not hold back the wild thing that lives deep inside. Insist on wings dipped in sunrise and a festival of feathers in turquoise and violet. Sing not like that mechanical bird fashioned to chirp each morning, but large and loud and out of tune from time to time. Fly beyond the sun. You will not be stunned dumb or become undone by wax melt. Free yourself from that design. Delight in wild wind currents and see from that height the monotony below. Cast off the fixed ideas of who you should be. When you are ready, fling earthward a winged doll made in your own image. Resist the myth that a brazen child will drown. Leave a storm of feathers floating on the water.
The next one is Eve goes it alone. You might say I undreamt myself. Under the swollen moon, I find him half in dust, wingless. He reaches for me, wandering my body with an ache in his side. He calls me Sparrow, Little Deer, all the names he's already given the world. But I cannot live in the landscape of his longing. He wants me soft forever. I am tendon and bone ready to move muscled and blistered beyond the clutch of this garden where roses dark petaled sorrow back each year. I must leave him in the ruins of us, even though I am afraid to wake naked in bigger ticks and tarweed with night cold on my skin and nothing and no one to hold on to when the beast that sometimes stirs comes howling, inconsolable, wild mouth filling with rain. And the last one from this section is called Daphne's Prayer. In, in the myth, Daphne, uh, tries to escape Apollo, who is uh, trying to violate her essentially. And in order to escape him, she becomes a laurel tree. Daphne's prayer, make me wood, make my skin hard edged and craggy. Make of my heart a dark lone splinter, the leaves of this laurel, my green armor in July. Let my roots be taken under the earth on which my body will not rest. Teach me the trick of not being, of wrapping myself in the arms of absence. Make of my mouth a half smile, numb as a berry, long fallen to the ground, and bring a sparrow to swallow it whole. The next section in the book is uh, a fairy tale. And there are five voices in this series. There's a uh, crone mother, boy, girl, ghost mother, and father. Um, I'll be reading a poem from each of these voices. And in the other version, Crone Mother. I found them in brambles, lip stained, the color of hunger. They looked wind wild, ready to run as if they had wandered days from anything called home. I led them through my dear ones, nutsedge and curly docks wove star flowers and a seashell into girl's hair. Boy walked behind. I learned he never turned his back on anything. Time knitted itself into a net centuries long, and we felt like a family of fish breathing for each other. I taught them, enter poems as living things. Inhale deeply. Taste the shape of words as sustenance. I did not know how starved I was for touch until girl rubbed oil on my parched skin, combed my white hair with a gentleness like a waft of rain. Boy's back ached from the old hatchet and the hacksaw. He fed the fire and kept us on this earth instead of in a private collection, locked behind glass, a first edition of ourselves. They said they fed breadcrumbs to the birds with no plans to re-enter their childhood, that father spun version of a mother who never looked back. Ghost mother, they called her, forgetting the endless nights of want, 
larger than their bodies, breaking them into whale. And how long she rocked them. Her voice, something only imagined when a strain of song called. Boy. The screech of owl trapped in my head. Crone mother always comes with a washcloth and tender words, du bist sicher, but none of us is safe. I kept from sister the tableau I remember. Father bent over ghost mother, head bowed in those hands, large as fruit bowls. Outside that terrible sound like a whole body crying. In the morning, wind filled the space of her absence. Day after day, only wind. Father, grief wrecked, nothing on the table. We ate breadcrumbs. His slur of words, we need salt. Father. As her belly swelled, she seemed to shrink from me, wanting nothing after the first honey days of our wedding. She would whimper in her sleep as if she were some feral thing lost to herself. She spent hours window whispering a song. It had no words. Girl, window dreaming through lace, the snowflakes large and brash, totally themselves until groundfall, a cold and endless welcoming. There is something about winter storms, the day leaving you to your own deep drifts, awake but not fully of the world, and all the edges softening into something other. And afterwards, the wind lost in stillness. The first walk into late afternoon, your breath against snow glisten, the moon taking its place in the thin broth of sky. Ghost mother, I am trespassing in someone else's life. Good wife and mother raising two lies. How to love children born of hate. How to keep the poison from us all. Sometimes I go alone to church, not to confess, but to join the vandalized Jesus in the garden, lifting his stumps. Perhaps he will start to bleed again. I know that loneliness begins at the wrist, then repeats itself like a stutter in the heart. But this man is stone. I envy his oblivion, the upward gaze some would call grace. I want to touch the half smile of his mouth, lean into the myth of his beautiful inviolate chest. This one is girl and it's a guzzle that relies on repetition. Girl, a young girl exiled from the arms of her mother will never recover the loss of a mother. Our shoes had holes when we reached the border. A man with rough hands said he'd take me to mother. I dreamt that morning would bring us together. The night is a knife without a mother. To wake in a cage, I'll remember forever. A boy said for weeks he had not seen his mother. Our hearts lived in rooms that would never get warmer. We began to forget that we once had a mother. Forced from home 
you are always a stranger. When we left, I lost the idea of mother. An orphan child will always be other, locked outside the sweet language of mother. All lost mothers wander somewhere together. The birth of a child, forever a mother. I live in a poem with no answer. Sometimes the moon, I think, is my mother. And that was the last one from that section. The third section um, focuses on art. And these poems are ekphrastic, meaning they respond to that art. The first one, below a sky that holds nothing, after Hopper, house by the railroad, 1925. One, beside the railway track, a house fades into its abandonment. The paint on the outside, once a deep shade of teal, remains only its thin suggestion. Each window blind half shades the weight of emptiness draining the sills. This was someone's childhood, that long forgotten self that waited for someone to enter. Two, to enter, you must first assume a door left open is the invitation. Honor it as you would a confidence from a new friend who risks a crack in the fence around her silence. Hold it close to your chest as you would a fallen bird. Three, untell it. No house waits by the railroad. You on a train, houses fall back before memory or before the first time you realize that lives exist everywhere you are not. That the woman hanging sheets on the line, now a speck to you, has birthed and lost children. And that after you are gone, she will sort socks and remember a moment in girlhood when the scent of lilacs filled her the way a boy's kiss would years later before you were born. And the second one is an Obad. It's after Hopper's Moonlight Interior. She wants to stay this way after he leaves, wants to feel the moon take its claim of the bed of her skin, of anything that can bear the slow bluing into night. It's as if she can see herself the way he does, naked in this strange place, half praying to something other than God. On the bed, on her skin, on anything he touched, she can still feel the salt of him. She wants to stay this way after he leaves. Through the open window, a sky bereft of stars is a giant blue iris that can see her the way he does. The ache of him is painted into the small of her back. Her body unfinished, she wants to stay this way after he leaves, and the vile curtain needs her in the room, needs her dark hair that makes of it a veil blowing away from morning. And the water pitcher asleep in its bowl needs her in the room, needs her not to lift it from the nightstand by the window. Nothing in this room wants the light to change. Now I'm going to read from the fourth section uh, that deals with um, more contemporary material. The first one, 
as well as an acrostic poem. It's entitled Phaeton after a painting of Chagall that's also entitled Phaeton. A thunder of orange brash against the sky, then flash after flash like a migraine. We stood stunned as statues or dolls in flames. This was our village. We knew our names and the smell of earth where we planted our dead. We made sure that even the young knew what the days wanted. But one morning, the stranger soared above the roofs, riding his chariot fast and hard like a hijacked birthright flirting with the sun until the metal began to melt. And we watched it, stood in front of our doors and watched it all as if something godless had fallen, burning into the dazzle of himself to leave behind as souvenirs, the singed wings of horses It's an ambush, a fire burst, breeze buzzed and ravenous for something nameless. We can smell it on the skin, a residue of ash and marl. The umber rises from within, forms a permanent dusting. The birds try to warn us each morning but all we do is thrash the air with our fire damaged wings. Oh, we could fly once, skirt the lies camouflaged as prayer, but we've grown ground tied and tired. Listen, we cannot surrender. Everyone looks the same under a red sea, even the little ones branded before they can walk. Their small fists rise on the shoulders of their fathers. Something must change. Our beaches are littered with the moonless gasp of fish. And um, this one was written during uh, the time when the border was such a terrible place for people to arrive to. The street without drums. Listen, this is true. We walked for days, the desert in our shoes. Our little ones ran out of tears. The sun was a blister in the sky. Before us, others had crossed. All night we heard the song of bones. Some said it was the wind, but no wind ever sounded like that. It was as if all the dead formed a chorus and the words split apart midair. We dreamt of what lay ahead. Distance was an enemy that kept growing longer like that parade of children the piper once led out of town. We knew that story, how the young ones never returned. We could never believe such a terrible thing until we reached the border. Years from now, they will say it didn't happen. And uh, this one was written a long time ago, but it resonates today. When there are no words, return to the birch of your childhood, press your ear against its bark, collect secrets you planted in heartwood, find your mother's house long gone, Lie down on her pillow. You will feel her night breath. Breathe it in. Beyond your bones, your mother lives. 
as her mother does. Find your mouth in the morning. Begin with whispers. Um, I'm a dual citizen and spent the first 30 odd years of my life living in Montreal, Canada, and then moved to the States, moved around some, ended up in Florida for seven years, retired there, and then decided it was time to leave. So we are now in Raleigh, North Carolina. And the reason I'm telling you this is because this poem um, covers some of that material. Before I became one, I thought all Americans were blonde. At least they seem to be, those tanned and smiling kids we met in youth hostels. They had names like Dan, Wendy, or Mike. Solid, healthy names, as if they grew up on corn, milked cows, or surfed in California, that distant place that took me years to reach. And even then, it seemed unreal, driving along Highway 1, each moment the kind you could die in, or at least the kind that lifted you out of yourself into someone else's road trip. Windows open, radio blasting, and you singing louder than the waves. In a way, it's a setup. An idea waits for you to enter, and it's a baptism. Doubts washed away, new skin joining the already initiated, and a story you can share so that California is not yours alone. And everyone nods while you eavesdrop on yourself, not quite believing your own words that sidestep the memory of the man sleeping in San Diego, the pavement, his pillow, one black shoe, an anchor for the cardboard sign, hungry, and homeless, anything helps. In California, I saw my brother everywhere in the bearded and bedraggled men leading on carts, arms outstretched, palm side up. Some muttered to themselves or argued with the unseen, their eyes flicked as quickly as sparrows fleeing a cat. Some called out to me. I turned away. Oh, brother, I have failed you. My life has been good. In Montreal, I visit him in the one room apartment his life has become. For years, he forbids me to hug him, says that was the rabbi's rule says his teeth move when he reads, asks me how to cook an egg. He was 18 when the voices started, says God is punishing him for once having loved a man. My brother turned 60. Every birthday card in Publix feels like a lie. Trump wins the election. My brother calls to tell me not to worry, that the rabbi says out of darkness will come light. There is a travel ban. There's no light. A wall looms in the distance. In Florida, houses built by dark haired men who sing pegados y milagros and el amor from ladders and trucks. They toss heavy tiles, mix cement, dig the hard packed earth for hibiscus to take root. Here, you can retire, choose your narrative, begin to believe it yourself. And this is the last poem I'll be reading tonight. And uh, Ghost Mother reappears here. Ghost Mother, I unlearned my future when I tripped over trees. Birdsong at my knees, like a cricket call. 
I never knew I was tall in my made to order world. Behind the plate, he's catching it for the second time. Everyone mirrored, imaged, custom fitted, life droned. We thought that was happiness. Wore smiles, picked at births, a pre portioned food, slept exactly eight hours. Our sun was a cutout, flip sided by the moon, programmed. We lived outside of metaphor. Things were not other things. Things just were. Libraries became one big how to with the last poet exiled hundreds of years before. We did not even bleed. But here, in this strange place, they call me the tower, the one who breathes through clouds. They say, I am like a giant fallen bird with melted wings. They say, I must learn to be small again, to build a nest, to come home. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We'll we'll do a round of, of Zoom applause for, uh, for Babo Kamal. Thank you. Uh, uh, Bravo. Wonderful reading. And I, I will say a, a really good representation of, of the entire book. You I think you 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 did well choosing. Um, you know, I talked in my introduction about the traditional linkage between poetry and mythology. Um, but I have the sense now that there are a lot of younger readers that may not have the grounding in classics that earlier generations did. And in fact, it's it's almost ironic that shortly before accepting your book, I'd actually rejected a manuscript that relied almost exclusively on references to um, mythology. Now, there was a time when you could reference a mythological character or story and feel fairly certain that a literate audience would uh, get it. It was part of our, our common cultural vocabulary. And, and I wonder if that's really the case now. Um, so I, I have a kind of multi-part question here. It's sort of like, why do you choose to turn back to these myths for your inspiration? Where How did this, did they find their way into your work? And in a similar vein, uh, your ekphrastic poems uh, assume a fairly wide exposure to painting or maybe these days just the ability to Google. Uh, but um, it makes me wonder in reading your work, do you have certain expectations of your readers in terms of what they will bring to your poetry in order to appreciate it fully? I'm, I'm curious about this sort of dynamic that the kind of material that you choose to reference, how, how does that relate to your sense of your audience? I'm just, I'm just curious. Wow. Um, <laughs> Probably should have given you that question in advance. But, uh. um, well, um, in terms of myth, why do I or why did I uh, find myself there? The, the myths kind of found me. Um, sometimes the material felt um, too personal on the page and I needed a different speaker. And I found that the, the women in the myths were strong women and I wanted them to speak. Um, in terms of the, the, the ekphrastic poems, it's a good question because uh, I did a, I have a chapbook of all ekphrastic poems. And when I did a reading, I actually um, had the paintings uh, projected on the wall. And I think that that really enriched the experience for people. But yet um, the paintings that I, choose or that I enter, they're not just paintings. It, you know, they 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 have a narrative outside the frame. And that's where I, I go to them. And in terms of what I expect the audience is to bring, uh, I don't really expect them to bring anything. I mean the way they react to the poems are it's it's not something I have control of once I let go of them. So I hope I've answered. Yeah, I, I, you have, and, and I, I love that point about uh, not being able to control. In fact, the sense that the work isn't really complete when you write it, it's it's completed by each 
listener bringing that different set of experiences to to your work into into any creative work so uh, but uh, anyway so lovely to hear your words today and to have a chance to talk a little bit about that uh, that process thank you so, uh, much. so um now we're going to turn to our second uh, featured poet today, and that is Richard St. John. So Richard, I see you're unmuted, so step on in, and we're delighted to hear from you this afternoon. Okay, thank, <clears throat> thank you. Um, it's really a delight to hear Bebo read her poems. I just uh, finished reading her book with great pleasure, um, and I want to thank all of you who have taken time out of your Saturday afternoon to listen in, um, but I want to Thank especially uh, Larry Moore and Stephanie and Sheila for um, first having faith in my little collection and, and also for um, all the really loving hard work and attention that uh, you brought to turning it into a real book. So I'm grateful for all of that. I'm gonna start with the uh, first poem in the book, which is something of a prologue to some of the other poems. Um, and it's called The Chorus. And I started thinking about it um, long before I was actively writing it. And, it. and it came to me that maybe the quiet, less heard voices of our world, um, people of course, but also voices of the natural world um, might be speaking to us like a Greek chorus, you know, suffering things, enduring things, commenting on things, um, not the major figures for making all the big decisions, but still a part of the play. So uh, here's the poem. The chorus worries, warns, watches the glow as the city burns, sees the women led to ships and weeps, works at the deli counter evening shift, survives the recent famine, drought, escapes at night from the Egyptian coup, kneels, at a routine traffic stop, breathes in unison, three-footed lizard on a low stone wall, swaying silver undersides of leaves, birds in mist above gray fields, their call, response. Willowy brown boy at the bus stop wants me to buy the transit pass he's got. What news from the watchman? What say the sibyls, oracles, sulfurs from the cave? Tells the on the street announcer. He was quiet, likable, a little strange. Waits in jumpsuits in a line of cells. Hordes used foil from meals on wheels. Dances, swaying hand in hand. Two Down Syndrome girls, new friends, linger as a wedding party ends. Tends the household altars, goes online to shop, files, forms in triplicate. Wonders what a life is worth. Passes numbly through the smoking shards, calling an unknown future forth. Timeless, trapped in time, impossible entanglement, ghostly traces in a cyclotron. Drinks the stagnant water and moves on. Hears overhead the F-16s. Carries cracked clay jars of barley, wine. Brings the offerings. So I guess we're all in this together. Um, just to give you a feel for the book, a, a little bit like what Babo did, I'm gonna read um, some, I read some shorter poems from each of the three sections. Um, and the first section of the book is kind of about the complex connections and complicities that we all share. And the opening poem in this section is called Down Syndrome Boy at the Movies. Down syndrome boy at the movies. I saw the face of God today. He was wearing an olive colored skull cap. Or maybe I saw the connection between them. His mother's arm draped loosely on his shoulders as they walked. 
The lamps of his doughy eyes burned only dimly. One chromosome tripled, as if Yahweh, insistent in his wish to take this frail, unlikely temple for his breath, should write the letter of his name three times. They were moving with purpose, already disappearing into the theater. Its body pummeled, stained red seats, the ghostly shaft of light that suddenly divides the darkness. Also, the suspense. They don't know how it ends. Although it's almost Hanukkah, the film portrays a close-knit band of street kids. Not the Maccabees, but Palestinians. Some rocks, some blood. The crowd flows out subdued, though beneath the brightly lit marquee, a quiet scattering of talk begins, and gradually, small groups drift off to restaurants or home. But on the sidewalk, at the darkened edge of things, the boy is sobbing. His mother draws him close and kisses him again. Again, she tastes the world's bitter salt. How, she wonders, does it end? Uh, the next poem in this section is called Hecatome, which was a Greek sacrifice to the gods involving a hundred animals. And this poem is in um, two, two short kind of mirroring sections. Uh, the first one's historic, and the second section is contemporary. Hecatome. A hundred animals, startled when they stop, and catching each other's scent. The priests would sprinkle barley meal and pray aloud on their behalf. Perhaps they'd pay, place a cloth over the beast's wide eyes to quiet them. Even so, the screams were terrible. The blood ran into the dark bronze bowls. Thigh bones and fat were given to the gods. Then everyone was fed. The late night deli clerk returns. A waft of cold comes with her from the storage room. She hefts a head of meat onto the slicing tray. She's thin, say 55 and black, pale hairnet underneath her baseball cap. She prints the barcode, slides the plastic sleeve across the countertop. Anything else? Her weary eyes meet mine. They're dark and lit with startling bronze flex. Uh, the last poem I'm gonna read from this section is a kind of uh, domestic, uh, but not really entirely domestic interlude. Um, we had at one point a mouse problem in our house. This poem is called Insurgent. Our poison killed it. So we thought. Then we saw the small gray mouse jerking in circles on our concrete step. We dropped a metal saucepan over it to keep the hawks or cats from being poisoned too, to stop the fall of death's black dominoes. Folly. When we checked, the mouse was standing up. Beneath the lifted rim, in shadow, we could just discern the breeding, dark, bright droplet of each eye. I gloved and dropped him in a bag, inside a bag, within another bag. And last, the armor of the city garbage truck. No getting out of that, except like minute, finely fingered stars, those delicate white feet 
that stalk our sleep. The second section of this book is kind of loosely about the perplexities and entanglements of individual souls. Um, and I'm going to start with the first poem in the section because uh, I think it's a favorite of Larry's. You mentioned it in the introduction. Um, this is called simply, the poem simply called Souls. And the opening is set in St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And uh, as Larry mentioned, you know, because Dunn's, Dunn's excuse me, <clears throat> because Dunn's tomb is there, um, you'll hear quotes from uh, one of his holy sonnets. But the poem ends in a different location, kind of a recollection of something seen at the British Museum. Souls. Around me flow the numberless infinities of souls. Tourists like me, except I sit alone, a row of wicker chairs back from the pews, dwarfed beneath Wren's vaulted dome. My prayer, one holy sonnet that I read again, again. Then Dunn's tomb. He stands stark upright, even in death. The sole memorial to outlast London's fire. Passing tourists barely pause. But let them sleep, Lord, and me mourn a space. Teach me to repent from dark self-questioning, to stand and walk. At the British Museum, I glimpsed a six inch Chinese figure, almost lost in a crowded glass exhibit case. T-shaped crutches, washboard ribs, rough rags, one twisted foot forever listed in the air, he steps serenely through the clutter of priceless artifacts and coins. Something I think I aspire to. Uh, this uh, next poem uh, was sparked by a photo taken in China. You may have seen something similar perhaps on the internet, a guy on a bicycle hauling a huge bundle of materials for recycling. Uh, this poem is dedicated for the friend to the friend who rushed showed me the photo. She's a very smart, intensely motivated woman. Um, but maybe we can all see something of ourselves here uh, in this little portrait. Uh, I surely can. Recycling in China. He has picked up half the city, a mountain of crumpled paper, plastic bottles, cans. It must weigh a ton though it might be seen as a trailing plume. Still, it must be done. And the bicycle, a fragile and gainly contraption, as if he had ridden it all the way from childhood, as if he hauled the jumbled past in cloud-like urethane. Rice paper sutras, pale as onion skin, Composition books, every test he ever took, every slight wooden abacus, bead of reckoning, still there. He pushes through the crowded squares and alleyways. People praise him. He bundles that in with all the rest. In his mind, he drags the weight or stone mirage of fog-banked Mount Ime. A haze of heat spills through the gauzy shape he feels but cannot see. On his back, a dark and spreading badge of sweat and salt is stinging in his eyes. Uh, this next poem explores a little more baggage from childhood. Uh, my childhood, uh, and it's called, What is Dancing? And forgive me, my wife has just decided to print something. You may hear that going in the background. But I'll press on. 
What is dancing? When I was 10, it was tap. Black weight of the shoes, the cleats, the swish, the steady clack. Years later, it was Friday in the cavernous gym, hiding by the bowls of chips and Chex Mix, watching the girls who moved so easily, the bolder boys who moved along with them. It was walking skinny through the locker room, the banter, laughter, and the snap of towels. Even now, I'm last to join the conga line, hanging tightly on, mimicking my best, the steps the others do. I'm told it's practice. Arthur Murray's footsteps pasted in a square, told it's simply giving in. Throb of the rave club, silvery tinge of ecstasy dazzling your skin. My friend Elena says, it's coming at last to love your body. Every tendon, every fragile bone. As in Degas, the moment when a soft light falls across a parquet floor touches a pastel ribbon in a young girl's hair. It's movement, she says, but not as if to get somewhere. It's turning, being taken gently into another's arms. The final poem in this uh, souls section um, relates to an encounter with another soul, excuse me, But it's, <clears throat> excuse me, but it's also a conversation with myself. Um, the poem is called The Turning of Her Curved Brown Arm. The Turning of Her Curved Brown Arm. She was tall and very thin. I only half saw her as I passed the corner she stood on, holding out one slender, dreaming arm making the slowest twirl around. I almost turned around myself, thinking what a grace she'd given to the day, wondering if there'd been a plastic cup for change. Later, I retraced my steps. She was sitting on the sidewalk now, black policeman leaning down, his partner looking on. From the corner opposite, I turned and saw that helped her up. Two white cruisers had appeared, more cops climbing out. As that edge passed, the black cop, bending down, had asked her, quiet, clear, so close, as if he'd spoken it to me. What did you take? Are you okay? Are you awake? The uh, last section of this book explores um, the borders and kind of boundaries that were sometimes called across. And they can be physical boundary, borders or and like in Babo's poem, um, encounters across race and class. Um, they can be the transitions of aging and mortality all of them liminal, mysterious spaces. Uh, this first poem is about the boundary between the material and the intangible, kind of a contrast between our apparently solid world of Newtonian physics and the mysteries of quantum mechanics. And within it all, um, our own influence, our own agency somehow in the middle of it. And also, and I, as I was writing this poem, kind of underneath it began to run, excuse me, began to run the biblical story of the feeding of the multitudes, or sometimes called the feeding of the 5,000, uh, which was said to have occurred after a lake crossing. So this poem is called, After We Crossed the Dark Newtonic Lake. And it starts with two epigraphs. We have traveled far from a standpoint 
which identifies the real with the concrete. Sir Arthur Eddington from Science and the Unseen World. In the second epigraph, may God us keep from single vision and Newton's sleep. William Blake, letter to Thomas Butts, 1802. After we crossed the dark Newtonic Lake, the crossing was hard. So hard, it seemed that only it was real. Yet remember the fields that morning, overlaid with mist? The dewy grasses, weaving and mysterious? Invisible birds, their whispered music reaching us across uncertain distances? That's what it's like, say the physicists. Everywhere fields of resonant potential, calling something forth. It was cold, of course, the air damp, so much hunger in the unexpected waiting crowd. Remember that boy in the story, his basket halfway filled with bits of bread and salted fish? He wove through the wisps of fog, more a presence than a solid fact. Passing out the scraps? or gathering them up? Or was that indeterminate? The boy was barefoot, his feet dirty. That little detail still breaks my heart. On his left leg, a rose-colored birthmark, almost like a fish. And the bread itself, each piece yeasty and particular. When the boy's frantic mother finds him at last, perhaps she slaps him hard, a rose-colored mark. Or does she open up her arms? When does a wave, a weaving end, a particle begin? What moves those hidden birds to voice their whispered fugue-like music of entanglement? How do, how do these fields take on such resonance and depth? When does it all become just real enough? So as I mentioned, <clears throat> some of the poems in section three uh, touch on the difficult crossings of old age. And uh, here's a very short one called Coin for the River Lethe. Um, Lethe, that was the uh, mythological river of forgetfulness or oblivion. And in some underworld cross, river crossings, uh, you needed a coin to give the ferryman to uh, get across. Coin from the river Lethe. Penny, 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 mini, my father, grandfather would say, whispering or shouting as he faltered through our rooms trying to get home. At last, worn down, my mother moved him into one. Now she repeats a phrase in conversation, like a worn coin dropped in a slot and coming up, return. It's okay, you're fine, I say each time, brightly as I can, taste of copper on my tongue. The last few poems in the book are about the porous boundaries uh, between life and death. Um, and the final one is called Droplets and Flow. It's uh, set in the Tate Britain, uh, which houses a rotating collection of the visual works of William Blake. Uh, Blake claimed to be infrequent contact with what he called his friends in eternity. His brother was one of them. Um, and at the time of his death, he was working on a series of watercolors based on Dante's divine comedy. Droplets and flow. 
I am talking with Blake, my friend in eternity. We converse, though not daily, yet vividly now in a dimly, in a dimly lit room at the Tate Britain. Blake apparently has been speaking with Dante because he shows me this image, Dante drinking from the river of spiritual illumination. A moment I don't recall from the comedy, but there he is, bent and kneeling with a little begging bowl, holding it out into the edge of a great waterfall, which flows ceaselessly from a ring of sun. The whole thing done in pencil and patches of pastel wash. The waters like a wide quantum field shimmering with potentials. And all of us with our tiny bowls, part of it. Droplets and flow, wave and particle, perishing and irreducible. Thank you all so much. All right. Very good. Thank you, Richard, uh, for that, that wonderful reading. Um, you know, it's safe to say that your inspirations here have ranged pretty widely. And uh, uh, I don't know how many people would put John Dunn and, and quantum physics uh, sharing a communal space like you've done here. And, uh, you know, when I was reading your collection, when I was first working with it, it you, you actually sent me back to a book I read a long time ago, which was uh, Doris Lessing's uh, The Syrian Experiments, which was one of her science fiction infused novels. And in her foreword, she talked about, it seems to me that there are ideas that must flow through, through humanity like tides. And there's a lot of those kinds of ideas flowing through your poems. And, and I would say also, I think this is one of the things that links your collection with uh, Babo's work today. And in fact, I wanna do a shout out to Shaheen Dill who's in our audience. Uh, in chat, uh, is she kind of had a rejoinder to my comment about, well, maybe people don't know myths so much now, but she talked about archetypes. And I think Doris Lessing's talking about archetypes too in, in talks, these, these ideas that flow like tides through humanity. And I think both of our poets uh, today have exhibited a lot of that. But, but Richard, um, again, I'm I, I thinking about Doris Lessing went on to talk about how she used these science fiction tropes in her work, but she, where she would really like to have written about, as she says, red and white dwarves, charmed quarks and colored quarks, but we can't all be physicists. <laughs> and uh, I, I thought of that with you. We might, we can't all be physicists. Some of us can be poets. And I'm, I'm struck by, you know, you've been at this poetry game for a while. So I'm, I'm always interested in where you turn for inspiration in your work and particularly how some of these physical concepts uh, found their way into this collection. Uh, well, I'm gonna start by with some omissions. Admissions, uh, I don't know the, the lesson, uh, but it does, but it does me, make me think of a quote that, that, I, that I like, and I think um, uh, Babo may like it as well. It's some, someone has said that uh, myth isn't something that, doesn't that didn't happen. It's something that keeps on happening. It, yes. I think that kind of gets us back to archetypes. Mm -hmm. um, but um, to your question of like, um, the, uh, inspiration of the in the poems. I mean, I guess um, I'm, I, because I think I've got in the back of my mind a worry, I don't, I, I sort of feel like, oh, my life's not pretty interesting. So I'm drawing stuff from reading all, all the time. And, I, and so I worry that occasionally that poems may sound, um, you know, a little too literary or whatever. So I try as a counterbalance to that, to really try and have the poems somehow grounded in in the real world and in, in real people and real experience and um, and I'm always trying to ask myself, well, what's the emotional heft of this poem? And um, again, I'm not sure how much I always achieve that, but I think it's um, trying to stay close to real people, real experiences, real felt difficulties that I'm wrestling with. I, I, there's a, a comment in uh, in chat from Barb Lambton who says myth isn't factual, just true. 
And I, I think that's a wonderful thing, again, to say uh, about you and uh, and also uh, your work, uh, Bebo, this uh, uh, a lot of truth um, on display here uh, today in, in your works. And uh, I'm, I'm very grateful to have heard from uh, from both of you. Um, we have a little time uh, if if there's anyone. Um, who has questions, I'm going to put my screen back to gallery view so I can see everyone here. Um, so if it's Bob, okay, I'm going to do a little shout out to Babo, which is please. Um, when I read through your book, I was um, uh, really appreciating uh, the ekphrastic poems a lot. And uh, many of them were paintings that I didn't know. But, you know, we can all complain about Google and all that stuff. But I'd get to a painting and I'd go like on my phone and go, oh, okay. Now I can see it. It's not the same as in a real museum, but I get the idea, and then I can move into the poem with some confidence. So, you know, anyhow, thank you. I didn't. I I love the ekphrastic poems. Thank you. Yeah, and Babo, you 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 can unmute now if you uh, if you if you want to to see if we have any uh, any other conversation. Uh, does anyone have a, a question or a comment for? Um, either of our poets today? Very fine. Yes, everyone is stunned. They're, they're, we're, we're all, we're overwhelmed. And I, and I say that was, was sincerely. I, I, I let off the day talking about how we really need poetry right now. We need, we, I think we need the reassurance uh, that, we, that, that comes from, from, from culture. Um, and these, these poems were, were inspiring and, um, and comforting uh, today. Um, since I, I don't see anyone uh, who, who wants to uh, add anything to the conversation, we may get out a little uh, early today. I will say um, uh, thanks to everyone uh, for coming, for being part of our event this afternoon. Um, I, I like to say nothing shows your support for uh, for poetry like buying it. So we, we did put, uh, Stephanie has put uh, links in chat today to where you can find Babo's book, Richard's book, and of course, where you can find information on everything that we do at Broadstone at broadstonebooks.com. Uh, if you liked uh, what you heard today, I know several of you in the audience are regulars, and it's wonderful. I mentioned Susanna earlier, Myra. I'm happy to see several of, of my Broadstone uh, community who joined us here today. Uh, we do this every month. And in fact, let me go ahead and I'm checking my calendar. We will be back here on Saturday, July 23rd for our next Zoom reading, at, which will be featuring... Uh, Tim Hunt, who is in the room with us today, hello Tim, uh, reading along with Amy Barone. So again, if you if you like what we do, uh, come and join us each month. Um, and uh, uh, otherwise, let's do one more round of Zoom applause for our readers today, everyone. And Real quick, it looks like Mariel Nelson has her hand up. In Does the... she? Okay, very and fine, Stephanie. Like you she might have had a question. So. Yeah, good, good. Let's get that. Thanks. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good, because my video doesn't work. Um, I'm wondering, um, for Rick, what entangled souls means to you? What's the entangling have to do with your book? Uh, um, it's interesting. One of my blurbers was sort of asking that same question. And they were, they were sort of quarreling with the word entanglement a little bit. Um, but I guess it's it's suggestive of connections between um, presences that that we that are the connections are real, but we don't really understand them. We can't necessarily name them clearly, and um, and so in the book, there are kind of connections between us, all of us in our sort of public lives as we interact. And then there's the perplexities and equally mysterious entanglements we find within ourselves where we think we know ourselves and yet we don't really know ourselves as well as we think, you know, and then there are the kind of entanglements across time and experience. And um, again, it's all so mysterious. And I think that's what's suggestive of, to me about the quantum physics is just, it's very, just, um, 
I'm no physicist. I'm not only um, aware of the stuff from, you know, really popular reading, but it's just so mysterious. Mm -hmm. And yet there it is. Uh, one, one physicist, I think, said, had learned about some new particle or something, and he said, oh, it was, he, was, he, he learned about uh, the, the presence of all this dark matter that we didn't know about, and he said, who ordered that? <laughs> Thank you. The physicists have some of the best words, too, for us, <laughs> for poets. <laughs> Well, you know, Richard, uh, I, I think it was Einstein who, who referred to the entanglement as spooky action at a distance, uh, uh, and 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 I and I like that. I really like the, the idea that we're connected in ways that we don't understand, uh, and and I think that's helpful for us, especially at times when we are divided by so many things, it's nice to be reminded that we are connected in deep elemental ways that we ourselves uh, don't understand. And, you know, we talked about archetypes a little earlier if, if, while we're being Jungian, you know, Jung talked about, you know, synchronicity and and the, the ways that we are connected. And I, I think that runs through the kind of mythic poetry uh, that Babo that you write and that Richard writes here. All right, anything else? Very well. Thanks everyone for uh, spending a good chunk of your uh, Saturday afternoon with us here for some wonderful poetry. Thank you, Babo. Thank you, Richard. Thanks our audience. Thank you, Stephanie, for running tech once again. And uh, we will see you back here in the Zoom room soon. Uh, hopefully you'll all join us uh, in July. So enjoy the rest of your Saturday. Thank you mm -hmm. all.